Good evening. My name is Ludovica Serratrice, and I'm the current director of the Center for Literacy and Multilingualism at the University of Reading. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the second date of our Be Multilingual online series. I think many of you are already familiar with SELM, as we call it, uh, because you have attended some of our events, either in person or online. Um, for those of you who are new to our center, SELM's mission is to conduct research, to engage with practitioners and the general public, and to train the next generation of researchers. Our research spans five broadly interconnected themes, language and literacy, education, migration, neuroscience, and health. And tonight we have a session on education. And so I'm very pleased to say that this online gathering also gives me the opportunity to welcome SELM's new director, Dr. Holly Joseph. Um, Holly will start in her new role in August and she is here with us to introduce herself and also to introduce our panelists. So I will pass over to Holly. Thank you, Holly. Thank you very much, Ludo. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming uh, this evening. Um, my name is Holly Joseph, and I'm um, in the centre at the Institute of Education, the University of Reading. Um, and as Ludo said, I'll be taking over um, as director of SELM um, August to carry on Ludo's fantastic work that she's been doing. Um, um, as we just said, we're, we're not just about research, we're also about communicating research to the wider um, community, and that's part of what today is about. Um, and um, I work, um, as I said, in the, in the education department, but my background is in psychology and my research interests are in language and literacy and multilingualism, so I hope that my uh, sort of broad range of interests and experience are well suited to, um, to sell. So today's event, like the other four um, events, so we had our first one last week, this is our second one, um, showcases the incredible variety of research we do um, at SELM, not only in terms of topic, but also in terms of approach, methodology and impact. So today I'm really happy to introduce um, four fantastic um, speakers, um, all from the Institute of Education and all speaking, of course, on uh, about the education theme. Um, so today we have Rowena Kaprovitz, uh, Suzanne Graham, Naomi Flynn and Anika Lina. So Rowena is a lecturer in um, second language education and she has research interests in, among other things, um, classroom based learning and foreign language pedagogy, the development of grammatical knowledge and the role of technology um, in language learning. Uh, professor Suzanne Graham is um, a professor of language and education um, and she has research interests in classroom based learning, foreign language pedagogy, the, oh sorry <laughs> that was uh, Rowena, although Suzanne does also have uh, um, research interests in those areas. Um, um, her, uh, Suzanne's research focuses on second language learner strategies and motivation, um, reading and listening comprehension um, in second language learning and creativity and language learning, which she'll be talking about today. Our third speaker, Naomi Flynn, is an associate professor of primary English education. Her research interests lie in pedagogy for multilingual learners or EAL learners in primary schools and what makes um, an effective teacher of English. Um, and last but not least is uh, Anika Lina. Anika is a first year PhD student um, at the IOE working with Naomi and um, Suzanne and her PhD research looks at the effectiveness of training teachers to use uh, the enduring principles of learning which is um, an evidence informed pedagogy um, which has been successful in the United States. So she'll be telling us more about that project um, a little later. So during our talks um, please do ask our speakers speakers um, questions if you would like to. Um, in order to do this, don't put them in the chat. You'll see next to the chat, there's a little icon that says Q&A. So if you have a question that you want us to ask, um, please put your questions um, in there. And if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll ask them. If we don't have time at the end, we'll um, send them to our speakers. Um, who may be able to answer in some other um, format. If you would like to make comments um, during the talks, that's fine too. Just put your comments in the chat. Um, but if you want our speakers to answer a question, please put it in the Q&A. Um, okay, so I, without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to our first um, speaker, Rowena, who's gonna give us an overview of SELM's education theme. Thanks, Rowena. 
Great, thank you very much, um, Holly, for that introduction. And uh, hello to everyone who is joining us on online today. It's a pleasure to be here um, and to talk to you about some of the research being undertaken within the area of language and education within SELM. So um, I'm going to start uh, the session by briefly introducing and giving an overview of the breadth of research being carried out by colleagues across the University of Reading within the education theme. And we'll then hear about two projects in more depth. The first presented by Suzanne, which investigates the role of cre creativity in language learning. And the second presentation is by Anika Lina and Naomi Flynn and explores how we can best support multilingual pupils within the classroom. So who are the members of the education research theme? Well, there's too many really to name every single individual, uh, but it's safe to say that we come from quite a wide range of backgrounds. Um, SELM researchers who are conducting research related to education are based in a number of areas of the University of Reading. Um, and you can see some of these listed on, on the screen there. And we really encompass researchers at all stages of their career, from doctoral research students through to well-established colleagues who, who are conducting large-scale internationally funded research projects. And we very much have an international focus um, with colleagues conducting studies in countries around the world, as well as in the UK. Within the education research theme, our research is primarily concerned with issues related to the development of language, particularly in instructed contexts. And between us, we investigate a wide range of related topics. For example, examining classroom-based instructed language learning and development, um, investigating different pedagogical approaches and their relationship with language learning outcomes exploring individual differences. So what is it about individual learners? What are the factors that may determine how successful their language development is within an instructed context? We're also interested in the teacher and have a number of colleagues whose work focuses on exploring teacher knowledge, beliefs, attitudes, motivation, and how these may impact the teaching that happens in the classroom. And we're also interested um, in the role of technology in fostering and promoting successful language learning. Our research spans a range of languages, including but not limited to those that are listed on the screen. Um, and you'll see from that list that it encompasses both modern languages as well as ancient languages such as Latin. And our research explores language learning across all phases of education, from very young learners at the start of primary school, so perhaps four or five years old, through to university and beyond. So in terms of our research concerned with pedagogy and language learning, um, we have focuses in a number of key areas. Firstly, we have a number of colleagues whose research focuses on developing our understanding of how effective different types of instruction are. And this sort of research will often involve comparing two or more different types of instruction through an experimental study and looking at the impact on different aspects of language learning, such as the development of vocabulary or grammar knowledge, for example. We're also interested in better understanding aspects such as the role of practice and the role of tasks and task design and their impact on language knowledge and performance. So we're thinking, uh, examining the different ways in which learners might be asked to use or interact with the language and how this might influence learning. We also have colleagues whose research focuses on understanding language teaching in antiquity. So exploring, for example, how the ancient Greeks learned Latin in the Roman Empire and developing corresponding teaching materials for modern Latin teachers to use based on these observations. And we're also interested in how different pedagogies can support the attainment of particular groups of learners, such as students in English speaking settings who have English as an additional language or for example, those in particularly challenging circumstances such as refugees. And we'll hear more about this in next week's seminar, um, which is on the theme of migration. As well as looking at the language development of different groups of learners, we are also interested in understanding learning at more of an individual level and better understanding what factors may influence an individual's success at language learning. For example, um, identifying the cognitive abilities which may influence language development. So factors such as language learning aptitude, analytic abilities, 
and metalinguistic awareness. So our knowledge about language, about how languages work and how they might be similar or different from one another. Some colleagues research focuses in particular on effective factors such as foreign language anxiety, motivation, self-efficacy and beliefs about language learning and how these may influence the learning process. Of course, when any of us approaches the task of learning a new language, we all have one thing in common, and that is the fact that we already have knowledge of at least one other language, our native or our first language, the language we learned from birth. And so therefore, a particularly interesting question concerns our first language knowledge and whether this has any influence on the development of knowledge in a second or additional language. And related to this, there is also really interesting work being done exploring the influence of home language use in educational settings. So investigating the educational experiences of learners whose home language differs from the language of the classroom. As well as research related to characteristics of language learners, there's also a core strand of research within the education theme which focuses on the language teacher. For example, investigating teacher beliefs and knowledge in relation to specific aspects of language learning, exploring how teacher subject knowledge can be developed in particular to support learners who have English or the language of the classroom as an additional rather than first language exploring language teacher identities and the influence this has on their practice, as well as better understanding language teacher education and the areas where more support may be needed. Finally, then in relation to the role of technology and language learning, our research focuses on a number of areas, including the development and evaluation of digital tools to support both language learning and assessment. And you can see examples of two such tools that have been developed at the bottom of the screen there. Colleagues are also interested in better understanding how language is used in online communication and how this may contribute to the development of language knowledge. So for example, how language is used in social media platforms and how features such as internet memes are used to construct and convey meaning by internet users. In terms of the research undertaken by our doctoral student community, this very much mirrors the themes that I've just sort of talked about with regards to research within the education strand. Our doctoral students are investigating a wide range of topics, as you can see from the list on the screen there, including factors related to the teacher, the learner, the relationship between first and second language knowledge, as well as examining particular aspects of language knowledge and skill development. So as you can see then um, in that kind of whistle stop tour, research within the education research theme really encompasses quite a broad range of topics to really broaden and deepen our understanding of language learners and teachers, language learning processes and language teaching approaches. And this is all driven by the overarching goal of um, supporting and enhancing learning and teaching in instructed settings. Our work is very applied and we work closely with practitioner partners to really ensure that our research is driven by the questions that language teachers and learners would like to be answered, as well as more theoretical motivations, and to ensure that our findings are of direct relevance to learning in instructed contexts. And I put a web link there where you can find out more information about the education research theme and about individual projects that you're particularly interested in. So um, I will finish there and I'll hand over now to Suzanne, who is going to give the first presentation um, on her project titled Creative Multilingualism. Okay, thank, thanks, Serena. Hopefully you can see um, my slides now. Hopefully there, let's get them in, into screen. Does that show for everyone? Hopefully it does. Okay, so um, I'm Suzanne Graham. I'm going to be talking about creative multilingualism on behalf of a number of, of colleagues who, who can't be with us tonight. But creative multilingualism was um, a very large interdisciplinary project that took place between 2016 and 2020, funded by the AHRC. And you can see here um, a number of the slides that were involved, uh, the number of strands that were involved in that project, looking at the issue of creativity and multilingualism from a number of different perspectives. 
uh, ranging from science through to languages in the creative economy, through to language learning in, ed in an educational context, which was the strand um, that Reading led and that I was very much involved in. So strand seven, linguistic creativity and language learning, very much considered the central project questions posed by creative multilingualism around the relationship between multilingualism and creativity. And you can see the project's three central questions um, on this slide here. So in the education strand, we wanted to explore the extent to which creative approaches to language learning might benefit foreign language learning and whether language learning can stimulate creativity. So I will define some of those things in, in just a moment, but those that was the basic approach that we took and the, the aims that we had in the project. So let's start off with some definitions. Creativity is, is notoriously difficult um, to define, but people have tried to do so um, nevertheless. Uh, a fairly commonly used definition talks about creativity as the ability to come up with novel but appropriate solutions to problems and that often diverge from conventional thought patterns. Other scholars see creativity as linked to a set of attributes or maybe even values that creative people are believed to hold, including openness to a range of experience, having wide interests and uh, curiosity, being broad minded, tolerant and tolerant of ambiguity. We could also speak of linguistic creativity in the sense of being able to use language that goes beyond just reproducing prefabricated or formulaic language using a range of vocabulary and grammatical structures so lexical and syntactic diversity in different combinations to express one's own thoughts rather than just reproducing the perspectives of others. Now, what do we know already about the relationship between creativity and multilingualism? Most research has explored this question from the point of view of what we might call um, naturalistic bilingualism. That's to say people who speak more than one language because they are brought up in a, in a bilingual or a multilingual community. And in that kind of research, it has been found that bilinguals have higher levels of creativity in terms of showing greater mental flexibility and creative solutions to problems. However, there's relatively little research from instructed and classroom learning, although there is some evidence that people who are more creative do better at language learning. And we can see that in studies looking at teenagers, um, a relationship between scoring highly on a test of creativity and doing well on an oral narrative task. And in a recent uh, review of the cognitive benefits of, of language learning, although there were only six studies identified that investigated creativity, it was found that there was a relationship between language learning and creativity, especially for verbal measures of creative flexibility. But what we really don't know is whether learning a language in a classroom can actually help people become more creative and whether that applies to all kinds of classroom learning or just some kinds. And those were the questions that we were particularly concerned with in our project. And we also wanted to explore them very much in the context of England, the context that we work in, for a number of reasons. I think really because we have a number of issues um, around language learning in England, and some of you may be very familiar with these issues. So first of all, we have low motivation for an uptake of foreign language learning. It's typically described by learners as difficult and boring. And, and therefore not conducive to creativity, being monotonous and, and unlikely to instill intrinsic motivation. 
We also have low levels of linguistic creativity. So a number of reports comment on learners limited capacity to speak and write spontaneously or independently. And that also relates to uh, low levels of vocabulary, low levels of uh, lexical diversity, with vocabulary growth being very slow in instructed settings. Vocabulary perhaps being particularly um, limiting in terms of whether learners can use language in a more creative and spontaneous way. Now, the curriculum has tried to tackle some of those issues, um, the most recent form of the curriculum that we have, and it does so by trying to include um, in what's recommended for teaching a number of what we might call creative materials in the form of songs, stories and poems from primary through to um, examination level for learners. So the idea that uh, when they're about 11 to 14, learners should read literary texts, the implication being that doing that will stimulate their creative expression. And that is also reiterated for older learners age 16, that they will be able to use language more creatively and in a more complex way to express their thoughts, feelings and emotions. So creativity is there in the curriculum in a number of formats, both in terms of the materials that learners are expected to study and in the kind of language that they're expected to, to use by the end of schooling. It's implied that literature, literary texts can make a contribution to that um, development of different kinds of creativity. If we think about, though, whether there is a role for literature in developing creativity, we have a, a slightly diverse range of opinions on that view. So on the one hand, many scholars believe that using literature and texts based in the culture of the target language country can, invite, can indeed provide opportunities for emotion, empathy, and hence creativity they may potentially offer greater opportunities for involvement with the language, deeper thinking, which might have benefits for vocabulary learning. Similarly, it might lead to greater risk taking for benefits for writing and maybe also speaking. But that isn't guaranteed to be the case. And a lot of research highlights that it depends very much on how teachers use literary texts as well as all kinds of authentic texts. So the how as well as the what is important. We also see that the emphasis placed on the how, the pedagogy of for developing creativity in general education research. So a report by Collard to the Scottish Education Department emphasized the importance of certain kinds of classroom activities for developing creativity with a focus on emotion, um, working with artistic forms, sharing experience, and a number of other important criteria. So what do we do with all, the, all that information and all those ideas? So in our project, we worked with around 600 learners of French or German across around 15 schools and we implemented a classroom intervention. We wanted to assess its impact on a number of areas. The ones in red are the ones that I'm going to talk about today, the impact on writing, vocabulary, and general creativity. To explore those issues, we implemented um, interve an intervention that was delivered by classroom teachers. And our teachers with their classes were allocated to one of two groups. So one group of teachers used factual texts, short articles that did not contain figurative language. And the other group of teachers worked with poems that contained figurative language. Both text types were very closely matched in terms of language difficulty themes that they uh, concerned and in fact we adapted a lot of the factual texts so that the language from the poems 
was reused um, and repeated in those factual texts so that we were trying to ensure that learners in both groups were exposed to different, uh, to the same kinds of language. All teachers then used the text type that they'd been allocated to in two different ways. So two kinds of teaching approaches. The first teaching approach we called functional, the other teaching approach we called creative. And I'll tell you a little bit about those in just a moment. Just to explain a little bit about our research design, we had a quite complex research design that we implemented over a year. So I'm gonna give the example of French to try to explain this to you. So you can see our two text groups here, a literary text group and a factual text group. We divided each of those text groups into two. At the beginning of the project, we tested learners reading, writing, vocabulary and general creativity. And then we started phase one of our intervention. In that first phase, learners studied three texts over seven weeks. Half of the group, half of the classes took a creative approach at the beginning and the other half took a functional approach. We then tested learners again, followed by the second phase of our intervention, where learners studied three further texts for seven weeks. And this time their teacher took the approach, adopted the teaching approach that was different from phase one. So if they started with the creative approach in phase one, they then used the functional approach in phase two. And then we had a final round of testing after that. So what do I mean by a creative and a functional approach? So in the creative approach, the aim of the teaching and the learning was very much to generate personal involvement. There was a focus on emotional, metaphorical and conceptual um, content. In the functional approach, the focus was on factual information processing, factual um, grammatical understanding, rather than any involvement or emotion or of emotion or personal responses. To try to give you some examples of that, I've got some uh, activities, uh, lesson outline, if you will, that we used with one particular poem. And hopefully you can see that at each stage of the lesson, there is a focus either on emotion, value and feelings in the creative approach and in the functional approach, the emphasis is very much on facts, uh, on grammar, grammatical knowledge, rather than feelings and emotions. To give a more concrete example of that, let's look at one of the, the texts that we use. This is a German poem. You've got the English translation there. This poem is about the end of a relationship, but it also contains a very large number of examples of the simple past in German. And it could be used to really kind of drill, to reinforce the formation of the simple past in German. And that is one way that it might be used. The two approaches differed very much though, whether they focused on the emotions or on the grammatical aspect. So it, here in the example that I've given, the homework that was set um, in the two different approaches for this poem, in the functional approach, where the focus had been on grammar and teaching the simple past, learners were asked to write a summary of the poem using the simple past and to narrate facts. In the creative approach, the focus had been on the emotional tone of the poem and learners were asked for homework to write a happy end for the poem and to imagine what a dialogue might have been between the, the characters of the poem. Okay, so we had a number of measures to assess outcomes as a result of that intervention. I'm gonna focus on writing vocabulary and creativity. 
So writing, we looked at lexical and grammatical diversity and complexity, as well as linguistic creativity and creative thinking. For vocabulary, we looked at the impact on learners' general vocabulary size, but also on whether they actually learnt the words that were contained in the text. For creativity, we looked at verbal and non-verbal creativity, and to do that, we used a commonly used um, test of creativity, most commonly used in adults, but it can be used on, on adolescence as we had in our study. Okay, moving swiftly on, what did we find? I'm gonna to have to just go over these fairly quickly because time is short. So let's start with creativity. So one of our central questions was, can language learning increase general creativity? So the ATTA, abbreviated Torrance test, assesses verbal and non-verbal creativity through three tasks. So in the task one, learners have to uh, write solutions to a problem. So here they had to imagine they could fly without an airplane and list as many problems as they could in three minutes. They then had two picture completion tasks. I'll show you some examples of those in a minute. And all of those tasks are scored for fluency, originality, elaboration, and flexibility. So to give you an idea of the, uh, the picture completion task, so learners are given starting shapes like the ones you can see here, and they're asked to create more shapes. They're then scored for how creative those shapes are. So a Mickey Mouse picture would be deemed to be more creative than just a simple chain. So our learners completed those kinds of tasks at the three points of our intervention. So what did we find out? So looking at learners' creativity overall across the year, we did find that language learning in the classroom could increase learners' creativity at a statistically significant level, but that was only the case for the learners who studied the literary text, the poems, regardless of what teaching approach that they had experienced. And that was true for both, both French and German. The findings were most marked for originality. If we drill down a little bit more to that, though, we see that for the French group, the gains in the literary text group were limited to when learners experienced the creative approach. For the German group, the gains for the literary group were there for both teaching approaches. So that suggests to us that studying poems in the languages classroom can have a significant impact on learners' general creativity. If we turn to vocabulary, which I discussed earlier that we might consider that as a, a measure of linguistic creativity, how many le words learners know. Now we had quite a difference in findings for German and French. German, disappointingly, learners didn't actually improve their vocabulary very much at all. And the biggest effects we found was actually from which school they were in. For the French, however, findings um, were more interesting. And overall, all learners of French made very large gains in their vocabulary. Starting with the general vocabulary size, so how many, you know, an estimation of how many words a learner knows in French, we found that learners who were taught using the creative approach with whatever text type and who experienced that in the second phase made the largest improvement with a very large increase in their estimated vocabulary size for French. For the vocabulary items in the text themselves, the greatest gains were made by learners who were taught using the creative approach and the literary texts and who experienced that in the first phase. Moving on quickly to writing, the task here was for learners to write whatever they wanted to in French or German about a picture. You can see it there at the top of the screen. 
to write about a half a page to one page. We scored that on a number of measures. I'm just going to talk about a couple. So first of all, at the most basic level, we looked at the number of words learners wrote at different points. So before and after each phase of the intervention. Interestingly, for both German and French, we found a negative relationship between making gains in the creative approach and making gains in the functional approach. So that means learners who did very well from a creative teaching approach did very badly from a functional approach and vice versa. That implies that learners are very much individuals, they have individual preferences and needs. Looking at grammatical complexity, for both languages, we found significant gains for the learners who studied the poems, but not for the learners who studied the factual texts. And that was true regardless of the teaching approach. So what can we conclude from that in terms of language learning pedagogy? So learners creativity, both on a general and linguistic level can be enhanced through classroom language learning that includes literary texts, and especially when there is a creative and emotional element and the focus is on that in, in the teaching. However, learners are diverse in many respects and that we need different text types and activity types and different teaching approaches to help learners in different ways and that there also may be language variation in that one thing I didn't mention earlier, but I'll, I'll mention it now because people usually find it quite interesting, is that while the, the learners of French were much more favorably disposed towards the creative teaching approaches and found them more helpful, the opposite was true for the learners of German. The German learners very much preferred the functional teaching approach. So overall, it suggests that in our teaching, as you, we probably already knew that we need some kind of blended approach that combines functional and creative approaches to teaching to create, to cater for that variation. So that was a rather whistle stop tour of our project, but you can read more about it in some uh, free online resources and materials. I'm gonna stop now. I'm gonna hand over to Naomi and Anika. Hi everybody, I'm just going to share my screen. I'm Naomi Flynn and you can also see uh, my lovely PhD student uh, Anika Lina as well next to me on the screen hopefully and I'm just going to try and make sure that that's showing as a slideshow. Yep. Okay, so thanks Suzanne for your talk. There's some lovely overlaps between what Suzanne's just said and what we're just about to talk about. Um, our project that, that Anika and I are doing um, is not has not yet started. Well, it's going to be in the initial stages. So we're telling you about the project rather than about the outcomes. And hopefully we will about be allowed back next year to tell you about the outcomes. Um, we are both qualified teachers uh, like Suzanne. And so our interest is very much in pedagogy. It's, it's in about how teachers teach multilingual pupils and in how and, and in, to the extent to which that might have an impact on literacy outcomes. Okay, let's, let's get started. So uh, the context of our study, which is um, a, a collaborative studentship project, which I'll tell you about in a moment, is that we're looking at, as I said, the, uh, uh, the teaching of multilingual learners in England. And that, and that uh, in England is around 21% of primary children and around 17% of secondary pupils. It's been around the same for about three years, despite Brexit, slight fall off in primary this year, but it, it's fairly steady. So you're looking at one in five children in primary schools have a home language other than English. We know from research that some groups of these learners underachieve, uh, particularly those who are entering the school later than the school starting age of five years. And we also know that teachers feel underprepared to teach multilingual learners. And that means partly that there isn't enough around uh, the teaching of these children with English as an additional language on their teacher training programmes. In other words, not enough of someone like me um, uh, uh, working with them. Uh, but also, more importantly, it means there's not enough continuing professional development for teachers. For example, you might train as a teacher and then three years later go into classrooms with multilingual learners for the first time uh, and you haven't got those skills because you haven't learned them on the job 
as it were. So that's that's a major issue, and that's partly that's the gap that our, our project is looking at. Also, in, in terms of the context, funding to support multilingual learners and their teachers has reduced considerably in recent years. So there's an issue that it's kind of um, more more children, uh, teachers feeling insecure and not enough funding, uh, and also uh, a tendency for schools not to necessarily prioritise uh, the EAL learners, not not because they don't want to, but because there are so many other pressures on them to prioritise different things. So that's the kind of context in which we're working. As I said uh, at the outset, it's very much a collaborative research project. So Anika is funded by an ESRC Sense, that's the Southeast Network uh, funder, um, uh, uh, which funds specifically projects that are uh, collaborative with um, outsiders, by, by, which, by which I mean public um, bodies outside universities. So the three of us, Suzanne is also one of um, Anika's supervisors, are working together with Aspire Community Trust who are a, a consortium of schools in the south of England serving the same diverse community with around 50 languages and they're very interested and we've already done some pilot work in one of them. They're very interested specifically in looking at how to get their teachers teaching in ways that support not just their learners who are multilingual but all of them. learners. We're going to be working with them using these things called the enduring principles of learning that Rowena referred to uh, in or maybe Polly referred to in her introduction of, of Anika earlier and the enduring principles of learning are basically a set of um, principles of standards of, of elements of teachers practice that have been developed developed by a lovely colleague of mine in um, Indiana in the US uh, Professor Anna Latimont and she's been working with them for well over 10 years now um, and she uses them as a way of training teachers so they underpin professional development for teachers for practicing teachers and they're also used as a kind of rubric for observing development and kind of assessing how teachers are doing once they've been trained in them so it's a very systematic um, approach that's been developed over a number of years and it supports we have evidence that, that working in this way thinking of these eight different ways of teaching and I can talk about them more at the end if, if there's time for questions um, that it improves outcomes in all pupils particularly those in areas of social deprivation but but particularly even more so for pupils who are multilingual it's also very cost effective because it can be kind of um, developed and adapted at school level this isn't something you have to buy it's about shifting teacher mindset to work with um, their EAL learners their multilingual pupils in certain ways and it's about shifting them towards what we call a more dialogic approach to teaching so what on earth am I going on about if I talk about dialogic I'm talking about the teachers planning activities that are intentionally talk rich the teachers saying less and the children saying more so that creates a kind of inquiry based classroom uh, and this obviously supports all our children, but it particularly supports multilingual learners because it gives them time to talk, articulate their own thoughts rather than having to commit them into writing. It also means they are exposed to discussion, vocabulary, all sorts of other ways in which language works through their conversation with their peers. It allows them to make meaning collaboratively. And importantly, and this again is echo Suzanne's research, the, the learning experiences that teachers give these children using this approach are contextualised in their lives. Uh, it's about engaging with and advocating for these pupils by reflecting their home lives and their school lives in the activities that, that we use. So a very creative approach, in other words, involving the same personal involvement that Suzanne was talking about. And this picture on the screen here is of three boys in a little literacy circle. This was a lesson I watched in Indiana a couple of summers ago, uh, obviously before COVID. Uh, and um, the, the boys are talking about a novel they've, they've enjoyed together. And you can see things like um, uh, uh, particular kind of sheets that help them with how to talk. One of them's got little sticky notes all over his novel for things he wants to talk about with his pals. Um, and it's the three of them leading learning. And that number four in the middle is them showing their teacher that they're on number four of, uh, of, the, of the activities that she wants them to do. So it absolutely maximizes learner agency. It challenges them. Um, it, it, it reflects their lives and it's very, very talk based. So basically we are two projects but we are completely interrelated. So my project is working with the teachers in three of the schools in that uh, collective I talked about at the beginning to uh, train them up in using this approach through us through um, training events, through uh, classroom observations and coaching, 
and then interviewing them as well. And alongside that, Anika is going to be looking at does this approach actually impact on these multilingual pupils in terms of uh, uh, raising their academic attainment? And Anika is going to talk about that right now. Lovely. Thank you for summarising um, the project so so wonderfully. I'm just hopefully can take control. Um, there you are. Take control. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so that, yeah, thank you again for summarising. Um, so um, just as Naomi mentioned, um, the supervisor and student projects, they are essentially, you know, running parallel. Um, and um, this graphic helps illustrate kind of where my PhD project uh, sits within our wider collaborative study. So um, whilst Naomi will be busy um, um, helping teachers develop that intentionally dialogic um, practice, I will be focusing more on um, the impact this change in pedagogy may have on the pupils outcomes. Um, so I intend to be working with pupils in year one, year four and year eight. Um, and I'm, I've been busy developing test materials um, that we will then use um, to track their attainment before their teachers have received the EPOL oriented um, professional development and then again after. Um, another really important part of my PhD project is also to um, understand what pupils' responses are to the EPOL because, of course, um, this once embedded, um, it can have quite a, a, a dramatic change, um, a qu quite a dramatic change on, on teachers' practice, which kind of almost uh, which is likely to then have an impact on uh, the pupils classroom experiences so we thought it's really important to sort of understand what the pupils thoughts are on the use of their uh, on the use of epol within their classroom experiences so that's that's another kind of element to my phd project um what? Oh, there we go. There, you go. there we go. Um, so my PhD project then has two broad aims. Um, the first uh, pertains to measuring the success of um, EPOL on multilingual pupils' outcomes. So we're looking at their English language proficiency, but in particular, we're we're looking at their speaking, listening, reading, and writing skills in English. And then the second aim is essentially interviewing groups of pupils in year one, in year four, and in year eight to really understand. Um, what their responses are to to the teaching techniques that are, are being used and that they're being exposed to through um, the through the EPOL. Um, so, to address the uh, first aim, which is essentially to measure pupils' English language proficiency before and after their teachers receive this EPOL-oriented um, professional development, um, we we needed to look for some tests, um, and we searched far and wide <laughs> for, for, um, a, a, some, for some testing materials. And we there are a couple of things that we really wanted in these materials. This is kind of my the, the wish list that I had. So um, firstly, we really wanted the tests to be age appropriate, particularly as we're um, working with pupils across the three different key stages. We wanted to make sure that whatever test materials we ended up using, they would be appropriate to those children in each of those year groups with the ease of administration as we work with, with multiple schools and multiple pupils. Um, and uh, lastly, we, we, wanted, we, we wanted these tests to be teacher friendly. So in the long term, we wanted um, these test materials that, uh, that are used in this study to be um, easily used by teachers and other educational professionals. Um, and uh, of course, throughout, it goes without saying, we wanted these tests um, to consider the needs of multilingual pupils. Um, needless to say, uh, this was quite a big ask to find test materials that fulfilled all of these requirements. Um, we concluded, uh, to the best of our knowledge, that such materials simply don't exist um, in the UK. So uh, what did we do? In, uh, in, the, in, the, in this case, we had to look further afield and um, we ended up approaching WIDA. So um, WIDA is, um, if I can, um, there we go. Um, so WIDA is a, um, it stands for the World Class Instructional Design and Assessment, but they're essentially a consortium that are um, based at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the States. Um, and they're very well known for creating resources um, specifically to support and assess multilingual learners. 
Um, their materials are used by educators worldwide. So over 40 states use WIDA materials to assess their multilingual learners in schools. Um, and um, fi uh, around 500 international schools across the world also use WIDA materials to assess um, their multilingual learners in their schools. So, um, uh, and it's important to note that the, these tests, so WIDA have been around for a number of years now, um, and they've got an, a number of different products that, they, that they've developed. And um, uh, over time, they've, they've actually, their, their tests and materials that they use um, undergo quite extensive field testing to support the, the claims of reliability and validity um, for each of the materials that they're, that they're you know, sharing with schools. And it's important that they, that they do so. Um, coming back to the context of our study, uh, in the end, we decided to go ahead with WIDA because they provided for us quite a good fit. They um, are able to offer a, a measure of pupils' English proficiency levels in a way that considered multilingual learners and that they are classroom friendly. These are used by educators worldwide. Um, and although we are in, but so very grateful to WIDA um, for granting us permission to, to use the materials, um, there was uh, quite a number of adaptations that we needed to apply to ensure that the, the tests that we use for our study were appropriate. So I spent a um, considerable amount of time taking these test materials and, and um, designing and ad adapting them in, in a number of ways. So I looked at, for, for instance, I looked at making sure that the language used um, in the tests for our study were appropriate for a UK audience. So there are subtleties between British English and American English. So going through and making sure the language suited um, the, uh, the, the sort of uh, vocabulary that we use here. So uh, uh, an example is, for instance, one of the tests, um, the context is about a, a child going uh, grocery shopping. And instead of using, you know, shopping for groceries, instead I've changed that to say that it's, you know, um, going to the shops or just, you know, going to the supermarket. So subtle words and um, vocab that just needed to be slightly adapted to make sure it was more aligned to the language that pupils in this country um, would be used to. Um, other ways that I adapted these tests include, so the contents, making sure that they are somewhat relatable to our pupils, and lastly, making sure the images that we use, and I'll talk about um, images play quite, um, quite an integral role in these tasks, so making sure that these reflect in some way the, the diversity of our classrooms in the UK, um, that was also important, so um, looking at language, the content and the images, um, and making sure that these were adapted in, so, so essentially the WIDA tests, they were our foundation, but we did need to make adaptations um, to make sure that they are fit for, um, our, for our study. So, um, just, sorry, maybe I think it's, it's not moving, but that's fine. Oh, no, it's gone the wrong way. Thank you, honey. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Five minutes. Okay, so very, very quickly, I will just talk through, um, so as, as much as I'd love to talk through each of the reading, writing, speaking, and listening tasks, I don't have enough time. So I will very, very quickly talk through the reading task across the three year groups. So here um, in year one, in, in the reading task for all three year groups, they're made up of 12 questions or 12 items, um, and each of these are multiple choice. So, um, and within each of these, um, it, within each of these tasks, they're then um, sort of sectioned off into four sections or four contexts. So here, these are just the first two questions within the year one paper. This, this context is about a class trip to a farm. And you can see, um, just by looking at the, the first few questions, very heavily built on images, um, uh, not a lot of text for our year one pupils, just to help actually ease them into the task itself. And even the answers, so, you know, the first question is simply asking them what to the class see on their trip and there aren't words in the answers but they're just pictures just to help them ease into it and then in the second question we've got a little bit of text but again we've got the images to help support them um, in in accessing this task um, going on to year four uh, we've got a little bit more text so here the context is about you know children in a classroom doing some activities um, and so in the first question we've got um, uh, so we've got uh, what we're asking pupils to do is retrieve some information. So they're, we're asking them which picture shows how Tom and Sam work together. So if they look at the um, short passage of text, hopefully they will be able to retrieve the information that Tom and Sam are working on a puzzle together. And so hopefully they will go for the answer B. 
And then in the second question, it's a slightly different skill. So now they've, they've got to read the text, um, but make an inference because the question is asking, what does Peter do to show he's a good friend? So hopefully um, pupils will be able to read through the text and understand that oh, Peter stops doing what he's doing and goes and join, joins his friends because they're, they're requesting him to do so. So in year four, slightly more skills uh, and slightly a bit more text, um, but then we've also got images to help support them. And then very quickly in year eight, um, we've got um, a slightly, uh, slightly more um, technical language, subject specific language being used in this context. So this is question 12. So the last question within the reading task, um, and it's to do with a human eye. So uh, quite a big chunk of text and lots of subject specific vocabulary. But again, um, whilst it is quite tricky, it's not too dissimilar from what pupils would be exposed to, say, for example, in their science classes. Um, so, and then we try and support them with not only giving them the text, but then we've got the image, which is clearly labeled, and hopefully that will help support them in responding to the, to the reading task. Um, so that was a very, very, very quick, and I apologize um, for the whistle stop tour of just, just to give you a, a quick snippet of what these tasks look like. Um, and, and that's similar, a similar theme in the other, in the listening, uh, writing and speaking tasks. Um, but what's next? Uh, so at the moment, I'm in the midst of um, piloting these test materials with, with pupils and schools to ensure that they are fit for use for our full study. And that will be, a, so the tracking pupils um, uh, attainment before the EPOL starts, that will be uh, towards Christmas time. So between now and then, if based on the pilot, I do need to make any changes, then I can do so. And, and I'm kind of working with the pupils to understand how, how the tests um, behave uh, when, when uh, pupils are working on them. And so that's um, kind of what the, the rest of the next academic year looks like for me, busy data collecting. Um, but, uh, that's, that's all from me. I just wanted to say thank you very much uh, for, for listening to, um, to our talk. And you know, we're, we're happy to take any questions, comments or, or feedback that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. Well done. Thank you, everyone, for uh, your excellent talks. What a lovely sort of uh, um, exposition of the varied work we do at SELM and at the Institute of Education. We've got, I know it's almost seven, but we've got three minutes and two really interesting questions. So I'm just going to ask them. And obviously, if you need to go at seven, of course, that's fine. Um, so the first one is for you, Anika, and probably also uh, Naomi. Um, the question um, is, why did you choose to use the WIDA test materials over well known, rather than well known standardized tests often used by researcher in the field of education, um, psychology and linguistics? Um, uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. And one that we we did discuss in, in the earlier parts of, you know, when I was starting my PhD, um, there are lots of really well known um, tests that, you know, for instance, measure vocabulary. So you've got, you know, the BPBS and there are lots of very well established um, tests that researchers use all the time um, in these contexts. And whilst um, it would be great to use them, um, what we wanted um, in this study is uh, kind of one of the longer term uh, aims is to ensure that whatever tests that we are able to develop, we want them, like I said, alluded to earlier in my talk, is to make sure that they are practitioner friendly. Mm -hmm. And whilst these tests are very well established and you know very rigorous, um, to try and ask uh, a busy classroom teacher who may have, you know, on average 30 pupils to sit down with each of their pupils and try and attempt a battery of some of these tests, you know, that may take, you know, for argument's sake, perhaps an hour. That's, you know, that's 30 hours um, that you're asking asking a busy classroom teacher to try and do with each you know you know with all their children it's it's um it's not very practical and coming from a teaching background myself I I know if I wouldn't be able to do that I can't expect other teachers to try and and do that and so that's why from the very beginning um we were we were really trying to find materials that were practical friendly that could be used could be quite easily administered by classroom teachers or other educational professionals in the classroom um, and that weren't so um, you know that, that don't require that much time and effort so uh, whilst those established tests are, they absolutely are you know um, there are there are a place for them the reason why we didn't want to use them in this particular study is because we're trying to find something um, that is classroom friendly and um, yeah that's kind of the main rationale behind it yeah yeah thank you that makes 
very uh, clear sense. Um, our second question that we might be able to just get in between uh, before seven is for you, Suzanne. Um, and it's asking about um, preferences for the sort of French creative and German functional distinction. And so the question is about whether you have any thoughts um, about cause, cause and effect. So whether it's because creative learners opt for French and logical learners opt for German, or is it because French is, French's romance lends itself to the style of teaching and learning more. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think probably there's some truth in all those things, possibly. I mean, I think, I, I don't know, massive stereotypes perhaps, but you know, people, so a lot of these, a lot of the learners had chosen either French or German, yeah, and the people who chose German, I think probably may prefer the kind of more logical, functional approach that might be associated with German. Although, you know, there was a lot of romance actually and creativity in the German text that we had. I mean, I think there's also something to do with the fact that the, the German texts, I think, probably were harder relative to the learner's level of proficiency. And, and that therefore, you know, I didn't talk very much about the order of their teaching approaches, but one of the findings was that, you know, learners generally needed a kind of functional way into the text to get the functional approach in the first phase before they could be creative. And I think with the German learners, probably having a slightly lower proficiency than the French learners did, they found the more functional approach easier to deal with. Mm. So it's a bit of both really is the answer. But as, as people are always interested in that. Um, that's the most interesting finding of the study perhaps. <laughs> so is it the case that um, generally um, students have a higher proficiency in French compared to German nationally, or that was just your study? No, not. I think that's not. I mean, quite often German will be introduced as the second language mm. in schools, whereas French is quite often the first language, so they might have had less time learning it. I think German poetry can be particularly challenging. So word order in German poetry is much less straightforward than it is in French. So I think there's something to do that. I mean, I also, you know, I commented that for the vocabulary for the German, the biggest effect was the school. Yeah, and we did have some German schools where they had very particular types of learners. I won't sort of go into details because of anonymity, but there was a very particular kind of learner in a couple of particular schools who liked a particular type of <laughs> It's all very intriguing. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. so yeah, school effects and. School effect was huge for German, really. Fantastic. Well, thank you um, to all our speakers. I found that a fascinating little top store uh, tour of um, the kind of research we're doing within um, this theme. Um, if um, anyone has any more questions, there are no open questions um, according to the Q&A section, but I'm sure our speakers will be happy to um, hear from you if you have any more questions or comments um, or want to get in touch um, so please do Ludo has also posted the link to our YouTube channel so we will be posting the um, the video the recording of the talk there and I will just finally um, post the link where you can if um, to everybody I will um, where you can sign up for our um, next three events. So next time is on migration. Um, so that's going to be a really good one. So um, do come along um, if you'd like to. Then after that, we have neuroscience. And then on the 14th of July, we have um, health. So hope to see um, lots of you there. Uh, thank you again to our speakers. And thank you to everyone um, for coming. Thank you very much. See you next week. Bye. Bye.